Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Mark Blythe and I am the director of the Rhodes Institute for International Economics and Finance, the Watson Institute at Brown University. The mission of the Rhodes Institute is to bring an interdisciplinary understanding of economics and finance and the entire sort of global economy if possible, down to the types of issues that resonate with people who listen to podcasts and tune into things on YouTube Live. So one of the things that we're doing is to talk about labor because labor is, of course, an important part of that conversation, particularly now, questions of the share of national income, labor productivity, and even unions are back on the agenda in the United States and elsewhere. So we thought it'd be a good idea to bring someone who can give us a great deal of historical perspective on this into the conversation. So I welcome today Professor Ron Schatz. He is a professor of history at Wesleyan University, and he's going to talk to us about his important and very insightful new book, The Labour Board Crew, Remaking Worker-Employer Relations from Pearl Harbor to the Reagan Era. Welcome, Professor Shah. Well, thank, you very, thank, you for, for, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the story begins... Uh, my, my story begins uh, when the, the United States uh, was uh, attacked uh, uh, by Japan and Germany and quickly by, uh, by Italy. Um, and it was not at all clear that the, the United States and its allies would win. One key factor is that the, the relations between labor and management in the United States were so bad and they do not have good systems for resolving it. Consequently, they create the Roosevelt established a committee, see the next slide, um, called the National War Labor Board. Next slide, please. Um, chaired by William Davis and George Taylor. Um, and I'll, I'll be pretty brief here, so I'm going to move quickly about these people, but George Taylor uh, was the associate director, but in many ways, the key guy. Um, he had spent a dozen years first resolving conflicts in the garment industry in, in Philadelphia, and then at General Motors in Detroit. His job became, along with Davis and the other members of that board, establishing rules, regulations for regulating labor and management in the United States for the, for the duration of the war. They, um, but they very quickly realized that they couldn't do this. They, they, they had experience before. They couldn't do this. There'd be thousands of disputes and conflicts and strikes. And they couldn't, a dozen people couldn't do it. Or even if they added 20 or 30 or 40 more, they couldn't do it. So they quickly re, uh, re recruited young people. People in their late 20s and early 30s, young assistant professors, young uh, lawyers, um, who would, and, and had them do most of the work out in the, in, 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 out in the, field, as they would call it. And they quickly uh, created regional boards and then boards for every special industry. And my subject is really about those, uh, those aids. Uh, the purpose of this war was to, to control strikes and control inflation. Um, let me give you an example of the kind of people who, who, uh, who George Taylor recruited. Next, please. Um, next slide. Uh, for example, uh, Jean McKelvey. Um, and she, uh, she is, a, 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 at that time, a, a, a junior at, 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 um, in, 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 at Wellesley. She, her family... Uh, hey, she, her grandparents uh, uh, were connected uh, to, to, to the Goodmans of, the, of, 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 of major money in, in, uh, in New York 
and in Rochester. And there was this is a serious young girl, but she had to be sit around with her grandparents listening uh, about, about the uh, swimming pool as these, these people mocked the Russian Jews who worked in their factories. Appalled by this, she decided, I have to study the slave relations system, which she did at Harvard. And then as a professor at Sarah Lawrence. And then when the United when, when uh, a Cornell University created a whole school for industrial relations, and she became one of the first professors. Next slide, please. Another one. No, back, please. One. The man in the suit, please. But one back. One. Yes. Um, this is, you may have heard of Clark Kerr. Here's Clark Kerr in, in Swarthmore College as a junior. He was a pacifist. He went around the country trying to stop wars to, to, for re, re, to, to, to the United States to, to join the League of Nations. After college, uh, she, she, for one last trip, she went, he went to California and, and found that the, 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 uh, farm, farmers and laborers were, were out of work. This is the, this is the early 30s. Out of, out of work were trading their skills. And, so, and this and, and intrigued her intensely. She wrote a five, he wrote a 500 page master's thesis about it and then went to, uh, for her doctorate, went to Berkeley uh, uh, in, in, in sociology and history. The, um, let me pause, correct my thought for a moment, please. The, uh, 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 and, and, and he and McKelvey and 20, uh, 250 other people were recruited by the War Labor Board to do the grunt work for the war. But about 12 or 15 of them were the most key people who Taylor used and moved them from all around the country. To, and and, and the, 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 uh, as the as the war the war dis, was, they were able to control strikes, limit uh, 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 inflation, and then after the war, when the board was shut down by by the Truman administration. They came to do the same kind of work under other auspices, employed by companies and unions, or appointed by governors or mayors or presidents of the United States to, to, to handle strikes and difficulties for the next to the war. Next, next slide, please. You'll see some examples. This is Sylvester Garrett um, from, uh, Phil, uh, from Philadelphia. He was in charge of the board in, 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 for Pennsylvania. Um, and here's a, he's a, uh, when he was 33 years old, he's in charge of this committee, much older, more experienced people handling on, in, on, this, on his regional war labor board. But he's able to, Partially, many of these people, including Taylor, Garrett, uh, uh, Clark Kerr, were Quakers, and learn through the Quaker meeting how to talk and talk and talk and talk until you got a conflict resolved. The, some of the board, the, the conflicts in, in, in Pennsylvania were intense. For example, in, in Philadelphia, in 1944, in the summer of 44, all of the white workers in the subway systems and the bus systems 
and the trains of Philadelphia quit work in a wildcat because eight men were being appointed to, uh, to, 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 to jobs there, eight uh, black men. Garrett had to call in uh, to the wall everywhere in Washington. And they in turn contacted the president who had contacted and the secretary of, uh, of war. And they, uh, the general, uh, the armed forces were sent in to stop the strike. We can't, we can't uh, uh, fight the Japanese or the Germans if we have to be on subways the general in charge declared. Um, next slide, please. This is uh, Jean McKelvey now, a mature woman in the late 40s. And she, she is she's a professor at, uh, of School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University. And, what, uh, and she's not only teaching this to mainly veterans, who then go to work for unions or for companies or for the government. But the, she's also every evening, she was taking these young men and putting them on a bus and going to factories and, and so they could meet with, uh, or rather to, to, to meet with the, the uh, workers there. The, uh, she called, she wrote an article about it called Bus 101. <laughs> The, um, let's go on, next please. This is uh, John Dunlop as a young man. During the war, he's a professor of uh, economics at Harvard who knows nothing about, industri about industrial relations at first, but they, they learn fast because they have to learn. And he becomes, the mediator, the principal mediator in for in, in the construction industry in the United States, all of the new ports, railroads, factories, housing for workers is all essential for any kind of success in the war. But the relations between labor and labor were not good. And, and Dunlap himself is the leader in charge of it all. Um, let's go on now after the war. Next slide, please. Here is uh, Ben Aaron and his wife, Eleanor. Um, when Ben Aaron, who was, who was a graduate of Harvard Law School, who didn't want to become a lawyer at all, um, uh, the, uh, was, he found, he remarked, it's strange, but the war for him was in a way a blessing, he remarked when I interviewed him. The, uh, he went to work for the board. And here, this, this, in this picture, he's probably 26, 27, 28 years old. When he first went to war for the board, he was, he, 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 uh, he, he was uh, 24. And he's so young. He looked younger than, than he, he looked younger than he actually was. And he would, he was put in charge of the machine tool industry in Detroit. And he'd go to meetings and the union people there and the company people there were just appalled at this young guy was had the power. For that reason, the president of the, uh, uh, of the steelworkers, Philip Murray called them the labor board boys. They're all almost exclusively, with a few exceptions, like Jimmy Kelvin, male. The, um, after the war, she's, Aaron and his wife are, are returning to, to, uh, to LA uh, 
Uh, he had been working for the resolving disputes in the in the airline industry in LA. When he's called, he's, st- he's with his wife and and and, and the in-laws looking for a house. And General MacArthur calls. He wants them to go to Germany for a com- committee to set up labor relations systems in, in Japan. This was the kind of opportunities that these young people were getting under, this, under these circumstances. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, let's go on, next please. Here is Garrett now. In, uh, in, in the 19, mid-1950s, um, excuse me, the early, early 1960s, excuse me, um, uh, he, he was, after the war, he, was, he, he, he got a job in, in teaching labor, labor law at Stanford, but the relations between the committees, the unions and the companies were so bad that Philip Murray called him and said, I need you. And so he went to Pittsburgh and became the chief uh, uh, arbitrator and mediator for US Steel and the US Steel Company and the, and the Steel Workers Union. And they had a system which they learned from George Terrell. And this I have to specify. The workers would submit a grievance. And either if it was not accepted by the, by the by, by management, it would go up to a higher level, and then a higher level, and then a higher level. And if there was still not resolved, it went to the top. And Garrett and, and his others like him, like George Taylor, learned that instead of deciding, yes, this is approved, this grievance is approved, or it isn't, he would write drafts of what of the decision and then show it sort of secret to the union people, leaders, and the company people. And if they didn't reach a compromise, he'd write another draft. In other words, he was deciding on the workers' grievances by by, uh, the, uh, by, by, uh, without the, the workers knowing it's a secret decision being made by these people. But as a result, they were able to bring down the hundreds of disputes down to a few dozen. Now, this didn't completely all work. And there was a, the biggest strike in American history occurred in the steel industry in 1959. And yet afterwards, because it was so hard on both sides, Taylor, Garrett, and the others developed a plan afterwards to prevent this from happening again and ultimately agreeing to the much dismay of historically that there should be no strikes at all in the steel industry. That's 1973. Next, please. But these guys went on from this kind of stuff. They were so good at this stuff. In the early 60s, the students were protesting. The student revolt developed. Well, if you are the provost or you're the president of one of these universities, who are you going to appoint? They appointed the labor board boys, 
or the labor board vets as the new deans, as the new provosts, as the new presidents of the universities to resolve this disputes. And first and foremost at, at UC uh, Berkeley and then UC California. And that was Clara Kerr. But Clara was not able to handle the free speech movement. Next, next slide, please. You can see their the, 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 the most articulate person, member, spokesperson for the, for, the, for the free speech movement was Mario Savio. And and he went to speak at the platform when, when Kerr was trying to calm the dispute. He was grabbed by the police, creating massive protests from the students at Berkeley. And this is 64. But over the next three, four, five years, pro student protests explode at universities from Kent State to Berkeley to Madison. And with yet it was ultimately the labor board vets who were appointed at each of the most prestigious universities as presidents, as provosts, as, as top deans, and developed systems. Next slide, please. Systems for resolving these disputes. Here is, is War uh, Robin Fleming at, at, at the University of, uh, of Michigan. And he's been meeting for 12 hours with representatives of the Black Action Movement. But is able to, they use the same techniques that they've used in industry now with the students. And as you all know, at every university now there's student, you know, student grievance have representatives on faculty committees. On, uh, 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 on higher ranking committees to resolve this sort of stuff. Let's go on next slide, please. The time is short, but they were not only developing this sort of stuff. Here's another one of the labor board vets. That's Marvin Miller. And he becomes the representative of the baseball players union. And Though the, the, the union is stopped, moves slowly. By 1973, 1972, the, the baseball players want to go on strike. Here he's speaking with, 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 with uh, uh, um, uh, 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 um, Reggie Jackson. Uh, the Oakland A's um, and the uh, and, and it's the first baseball strike and successful one. But they were not successful in every respect. Let's move on. Next one, please. Dunlop now is a professor. He's, he, he's done the same sort of thing. He did the same thing at, at Harvard to try to control and successfully bring things to a calm at heart. Then he, he is appointed by President Nixon and President Ford to successive uh, committees, but for the new problem of stagflation and stagflation they were unable to cope with and ultimately brought down their system. Yet this was not the end of it all. These had uh, just the five minutes here. They did. They had. They had. You know, as professors of, of, of top ranking professors, they had dozens, even 
of, of uh, uh, or, or, or I should I should add because they, they were doing the same sort of stuff, not only baseball, but the public employees unions. Well, uh, in the system, um, the, the teachers unions, prison unions, more from, from they were all devised those systems too. But why? They had many, many students and graduate students, but only one of them was as smart and had their commitment and their think mindset as these labor board vets. Next slide, please. And that was a Marine named George Schultz, who fought uh, in the Pacific and then when return uh, to, Emma, to Boston and the Marines had no work for him. So he said, can I take some classes at, 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 at MIT? Next slide, please. And from there, he becomes a professor of industrial relations at, 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 at MIT for many years. And then at the University of Chicago and Dean of the Business School of Chicago when Richard Nixon uh, recruits him to become Assistant Secretary of Labor. There, he not only deals with labor questions, which you're familiar with, he also, as Secretary of Labor, used the same mediation techniques to end racial segregation in the public schools in the, in the segregation segregated South. Again, Schultz uses the same kind of techniques to introduce affirmative action in the steel industry, in the construction industry, uh, in, the, in, in the universities, ultimately in all of American businesses. From Schultz. And then last, but not least, after Schultz is in the uh, Nixon administration, he leaves, goes into business in the largest uh, construction uh, firm, in, 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 international construction. Uh, in, 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 in the United States based in, in, in uh, San Francisco. Also teaching at Stanford, writing when he is, he is uh, Ronald Reagan calls him his Secretary of State, Alexander Haig, is proved to be a disaster. And so he asks Schultz to come and become Secretary of State. And this is the early 80s when there was a second Cold War, indeed more than a Cold War, when it appeared in Moscow that the United States, they thought, might attack the Soviet Union. There was, the, we think of the Cold War as greatest in the late 40s and early 50s, but it was a second intense period in the early 80s. And Schultz was Secretary of State with great difficulty, not least because there are so many others in the Reagan administration who despised the Soviet Union and were trying, would make no compromises. But there was some, Schultz was key, also the first lady, and indeed Reagan himself. And at last, there is a break 
when a younger leader is appointed as secretary, uh, as secretary general of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And that's Michel, Mikhail Gorbachev. And next, please. Schultz uses the same sort of mediation and negotiation techniques that he learned from his mentors to persuade the Soviet leaders that Reagan, despite his reputation as a warmonger, was in fact peace-minded, that it was in their interest, economic, to make compromises, persuaded Ronald Reagan that he needed to make those compromises. And he is fortunate that a success of, 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 of the Truman militaristic members of the Reagan administration were forced to resign. And the first compromises, first reduction in, in, in nuclear weapons begins in the Reagan administration in 1987 and 88. And indeed, by the time that Schultz and leaves, the war, Cold War was all almost over. So in one sense, you might say these men and women were highly successful. But while they're doing this, what their, their, their attempts in industry were increasingly failing. Well, that's a I'll stop at that point. Thank you. I'm open for all kinds of questions. Thank you very much, Ron. That's great. Uh, great overview of the book. Um, we have uh, attendees. Uh, if you want to raise a question, just use the hand function, pick the hand up, or call on you. If you're watching this on YouTube Live and you want to put a question out, just put it in the YouTube Live chat, and then we'll pick it up and we'll pose it straight to Ron. Um, to get it kicked off, I got a lot of questions. We're eventually going to do a podcast on this. So I just want to get this conversation going. This is a fascinating book because when we think of international industrial relations systems, we tend to think of institutions. You think of things like your labor crew guy going to Germany and being involved in setting up co-determination. So there's a law and that law is this thing that companies need to do. But you're telling us a much more micro story about, if you will, a generation or two generations of extremely committed individuals who, in a sense, invent a profession called industrial relations and a set of mediation techniques, which basically constitutes how America governs its economy for a long period of time. Would it be fair to say that if we wonder why it is that the United States unions are now so small in comparison to other countries, it's partly because as that generation got older and moved on from the scene, there was no real institutional support for those unions in the way that there was in other countries. Would that be an inference we could draw from this one? Uh, that's a very good and important question. First, in France, the unions have weakened also. In most of, of, of Western Europe, where they were strong, unions have weakened. Uh, not to the same extent as the United States, but the United States it's been, remained strong in, uh, in uh, or became, became strong in new industries, mm -hmm. for example, in, the, in public education and, 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 uh, and higher education. Uh, and in the public schools, I mean, and in, and in the uh, police and the fire departments, which were had no unions before these people came into being. Um, but the long-term trend is downward here, 
Was, was this become, this interview, uh, one of my uh, colleagues in labor history, uh, Nelson, Nelson Lichtenstein, believe, and uh, several others too, argue that, that, that it was because of the systems that the labor board vets introduced that the unions declined. He made that argument uh, in, in the 1980s and nine, 1980s, uh, and the argument was widely accepted amongst labor historians. But it's really flawed, deeply flawed. Um, and the, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Lichtenstein himself, with whom I'm friends, um, the, uh, uh, reversed his own opinion on it by the turn of the 21st century. Um, so I don't, I don't think that these people are the reason that unions have declined. I think that we're, we have to go to broader factors than this. Great. Speaking of those broader factors, I'm going to ask Andrew Schrank to come on and, and ask what he put into the chat rather than me reading it out. Can you do that, Andrew? Perhaps not. Okay, if Andrew can't do it, then I'm going to ask his question. Absolutely fascinating account. Thank you. I was wondering whether you might say something about the Dunlop Commission on the future of worker management relations in the early 1990s and how it looks from the perspective of 2021 when discussions of the future of work are suddenly back on the table. It seems omnipresent. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. It's an, uh, an, uh, very... First, Dunlap was on the, the, the so-called Dunlap Commission. He was doing this when he was in his, in his 80s. These guys were, I mean, most people, when they get to be 65 or 70 or 75, they retire. F1 people do anyhow. They go into golfing. They go into gardening. These people never stopped. Kerr, Dunlop, McKelvey. They did it to the very end of their lives because they had it, they had a mission to improve the world. Um, one. As as in the late 80s and early 90s. Dunlop succeeded in certain areas. For instance, uh, maybe some of you are graduates of, uh, are, were graduate students at, at Harvard. Um, and the management at, at Harvard, uh, the administration at Harvard was very strongly opposed to the TA union. But the Dunlop persuaded Derek Bach, the president of Harvard, who was one of his protégés and also an industrial relations guy, that they ought to recognize the technical workers union, the clerical workers union, which, which the uh, uh, others in the administration were strongly opposed. And, and Dunlop, Help develop a, a system for conflict resolution, which is quite unique at Harvard. Um, not like the like like the system, say at at, at Yale, which is quite uh, 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 animos full of animosity. They developed a, 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 a system that was uh, one done up similarly. Um, you know, we we're familiar with the. Uh, Cesar Chavez and the farm workers in California, but that proved ultimately to be a uh, to, uh, to to be uh, merely a, a, a cult and utterly unsuccessful. By by contrast, Dunlop was quite able able to work with uh, a, a a a farm workers union. In, in the Midwest, um, and, and successfully so. That said, 
there. So you keep successful in those areas. But when we get to the Dunlop Commission, the Dunlop Commission, the hostile, it appeared maybe they could do something in the first uh, uh, two years of the of the Clinton administration. But when the when the when the Republicans made a powerful push in six in ninety four, the Dunlop Commission was bound to be dead. Um, I mean, want to go on, please. But but in terms of what Andrew was also asking was to the extent that they did actually have a commission and they said stuff, a lot of it concerning the future of work seems to be very perceptive in terms of uh, reading the current environment from the perspective of the 1990s. They were very forward looking. Do you have any thoughts on that? That, that I hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, uh, that, that, I, 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 I need to mull that over. Because generally, you know, the labor historians generally think the, the Dunlop Commission is a, a disaster. To think of it as uh, as prescient mm -hmm. uh, is 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 is, uh, is is unique, and I, 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 that deserves serious consideration. We've actually managed to give everyone their microphones back. Uh, that was a technical snafu. Andrew, if you want to come back in and follow up on that now, by all means do so. If anyone else wants to have a talk, please come in. Uh, can you hear me, Mark? Yeah, we can hear you. Go for it. So uh, one, I mean, it does strike me that a lot of what was in the Dunlop Commission report was remarkably prescient, although I too hadn't really thought of it that way. Um, the other thing that strikes me, since you mentioned the issue of um, teaching assistance unions, is the first three officially recognized TA unions in the country were at Berkeley, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And I think the one at Michigan was actually recognized under Fleming, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And um, the other question I have is whether you could say something about the students of Dunlop and Care and these folks and what happens to the next generation uh, and the legacy, if any. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the TA, the teachers, teachers assistant association. Um, I mean, I was there then. Um, I'm, next to me at this uh, little room here is my wife, who was even more involved at that time at, at, at Wisconsin. Um, well, be, because because Fleming was was the uh, chancellor at at Wisconsin before he was president at at at, at, at uh, Ann Arbor. Um, and the um, the at 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 Madison, this the uh, no, uh, my mind. I'm maybe confusing for a moment now. Uh, Matt Madison and Ann Arbor, when the when the, when the uh, students, uh, 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 teacher assistants, uh, were arrested by the police, Fleming wrote checks and bailed them out. That's how smooth they were. Um, on, on to the question of legacies, what happens to the students of the students? What happens to the ones that come after Schultz, et cetera? Do they well, I mean, have management still, consultants? They, 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 I mean, where do they go? Well, I mean, you know, there is still a, a Dunlop and, and, and before him, uh, there was, there, there was a, a teacher, a professor, a, a labor school at Harvard, just like there was similar things at most major universities. Um, but, and so there are some professors who, protégés of, of Dunlop and, and, and the uh, other labor board people uh, who persist, but most go on to other fields. They don't have a, a next generation. They have predecessors in our, Gene Adams is a predecessor. 
uh, um, the, uh, the 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 uh, First World War labor board. Uh, uh, William Rogerson. There's a princess, They have predecessors, but this this there's they don't have uh, 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 successors. It's just, it's it's uh, uh, you might say it's a sad story. But why do you think that is? Why do you think that essentially the, the generational transmission of this knowledge and this ambition kind of dies with Schultz? As you say earlier on, and you note in the book, what really undoes this is stagflation. So is it is it the kind of the macroeconomic crisis of the 70s which delegitimates Labour's claims so that the Labour board itself has less authority? How do you think about that? Yes, I see the, 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 the stagflation as undermining it. The succeed before then, they could succeed through a combination of guaranteed wage increases at, at, uh, and, gear, and price increases. And, and in each of the major industries that guaranteed both. But that no longer was feasible. So once we broke that kind of virtuous circle of high wages necessitating productivity increases, which then allowed you to pass on the costs without causing inflation, once that model comes undone, they lose authority. And then it, only, it only then, that's why people like Schultz become important, because he's part of that crew, but he gets, in a sense, picked up and transplanted into a very different world. Yes, but quite, nonetheless, he's still very effective. Quite, 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 quite so, Mark. And, but there are, unions are strong nonetheless, but they're in the public sector. What happens in the public sector? They, they still can, the, the unions are able to get significant increases, but you get a powerful kickback. Mm -hmm. The right-wing movement is, is, is contributing to the conservatives of, 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 the, of the, 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 that we, we know of in so many ways. Part of it comes exactly from the, the re rebellion against high paid, high compensation for, for unions. So, certainly, certainly not for employers, but certainly for unions. Uh, Andrew wants to come back in. Andrew, come on back in. Yeah, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Ron. Just trying to tie some of this together. Uh, when I was at Wisconsin in the 90s uh, and was on the board of the Teaching Assistance Association, um, the AFT local there, uh, the director of the state AFL-CIO, Dave Newby, uh, had come out of that union, and the director of the local Central Labor Council, Jim Cavanaugh, had come out of that labor union. The point being the teaching assistance union had left a real footprint in the Wisconsin labor movement. But the irony is that they were presiding over a labor movement that was no longer dominated by industrial workers, was dominated by public sector workers. Uh, the economy was deindustrializing. Baumol's disease was everywhere. Uh, and the Dunlop Commission saw all this and saw it playing out in real time. And I think that's what I mean by both the legacies, but the legacies are overwhelmed. The professional legacies are overwhelmed by the structural change in the economy that Dunlop in his 80s was, was watching. Um, uh, I th uh, Andrew, I think you hit it right on the, hit it exactly. Um, I, I see my, uh, Michael Puri has, has a word. Yeah, Michael says, uh, you want, Michael, you want to come in and just make your own point? Just come in and join the conversation. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. The, the Michael, thing, I mean, I, unfortunately, I couldn't come to the beginning of this talk. I was um, in another meeting. But I, it seems to me you, uh, that in the discussion of all this, you're underestimating the change in the labor law as mediating, the, as interpreted by the courts as mediating all this. And, and in terms of court interpretation, that is the constitutionality of the Wagner Act uh, depends very much on, uh, on, on the Commerce Clause and industrial peace. 
and the ability of uh, after uh, particularly after 1980 of uh, unions to threaten industrial peace was uh, declined precipitously. And if you look at and and so if you if the if the courts are weighing um, say the right to strike or the right to picket or whatever against free speech and so on, and the weight is dependent on how 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 much uh, labor unions or um, and and industrial organizing is is a threat to the commerce clause. The 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 weights had to shift as the as as the unions' power to uh, to disrupt the economy uh, declined. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts there, Ron? How do you balance that change in law at the same time as, if you will, the decline in power of this uh, network that you're describing? Which sort of, you know, makes us wonder, mm, did uh, Sam Goppers have some wisdom to depend on the government to be your source means also if you lose it, you are on very shaky ground. Um, well, the one the, I wouldn't glorify <laughs> Gompers though, because uh, it, he he didn't organize industry. What's that again, please? Gomper, that is, it's it's true that I mean Gompers, he had a strategy which which. In a, which which um, didn't manage to <laughs> encompass industrial unionism. No, but but the idea that perhaps there's something to, to the idea that depending on the government, so that you know it's other unions on the other hand, not Gompers, but the uh, the construction industry, for instance, uh, did not depend on, on the federal government for its or for its base. Um, uh, Michael, I'm also thinking, if I'm not mistaken, I was at a conference uh, for, I think it was for when Philip Murray, uh, uh, an anniversary of, 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 of his birth or his death, and, and a person there, and I think it was you, uh, said, wait a second, the person you really have to understand is George Taylor. Have to understand, sorry, what? Ha the person you have to understand who had such an impact was George Taylor. And it had an impact yeah. on me. You know, I've been already studying these guys, but, but nobody else before that was talking about Taylor. And if I'm not mistaken, Unless you you know I'm confused with another person, but I don't think I was. No, no, no. That, that it was Taylor is is the key guy. Well, certainly I I may not have said that then, <laughs> but I was talking about Taylor, uh, and um, and 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 I think Taylor had a big influence on how Dunlop. Um, uh, sure. Uh, uh, set up the, the construction unions. Uh, sure. Sure, uh, definitely. We're, we're running a little bit out of time. I want to move it along. We've got one question in the Q&A from Bill Herbert, which says, a historical question. Which of the Labour Board boys were not involved in the National War Labour Board decision in 1942 to not assert jurisdiction over public sector labour disputes in New York and New York City? Did any of them regret that decision? So who was who was or who wasn't involved in that decision, and did they live to regret it? Well, the, if, if I understood that correctly, they're not involved in the, the, the decisions about about the about the u, public unions in 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 New York uh, until the uh, until the nineteen sixties. Ah, I see. Not not the forties. I mean, you know, well, the first step here is is uh, is Secretary of Labor uh, Arthur Goldberg, uh, with his background in the in the steel industry, uh, has and it persuades uh, John F. Kennedy to that the, the, the 
that, that, that unions are legitimate in, if for federal employees. And then the same is, continues into a series of states, not every state by any means, but states which are which are where which which were had liberal, relatively speaking, uh, governors. So New York State, all right, um, uh, Wisconsin, uh, 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 Connecticut, at all. So that's where the strike, the unions become strong then, but not back in the forties. Okay, well, I wish we had more time to go into this, but I'm going to close with one question from Alexander Gard Murray, who brings us very much into the present. What lessons should we take from the Labour Board crew experience for addressing today's breakdowns in interest mediation? What should the Biden administration learn, for example? Or are the challenges so different now that their experience can't guide us anymore? Well, it's a good question now, but, you know, as a historian, I'm loath to say what, what one should do for the now and in the future. I really, you know, I don't feel confident doing that. What, what I do see is that what they did in industry then moves into other kinds of mediation. Mm -hmm. So that whereas we used to have divorce lawyers, now we have mediation between un unhappy spouses. Um, it moves into other realms. From, from industry to another aspect of society. So at the end of the day, we all become subject to mediation, even if its effects are much more diffuse and uncertain than they used to be. Mm, yeah, perhaps so. All right, great. We're just at time now. I want to thank you for coming on and talking today, Ron. It's a fascinating book. I do recommend it to everyone. Thanks to everyone who's watching on YouTube. Thanks to the participants here. Uh, it's been a great conversation. We'll be in touch and do the podcast soon. Um, that was great. Thank you once again. Well, thank you. And if anybody wants to talk, you know, email me and I'll be happy to talk. Just uh, our shots at Wesleyan. All right. Thank you. Well. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much.